for our next presentation and let's welcome Dr. Matthew Mount, whose talk will focus on just in time and Great. Thank you so much for that introduction. Thanks to the young team for putting together this meeting. Thank you all for being here. Um, as Adam Price, I'm going to talk about just in time interventions. I'm going to do so fairly quickly because I know I'm sensitive to how much time is left. There's another presentation after this and then lunch. So I, don't, I, I know all the dangers of standing between everyone at lunch. So I'll go through as fairly efficiently. Um, so I have to talk about just in time interventions, but I thought before talking about just in time interventions, we have to talk about what just in time means. So I'm going to talk a little bit about prediction as well. So very quickly to move through what we know about the science, the state of the science for prediction. Um, although suicide is a leading cause of death, we know that it's a pretty low base rate behavior. So we need generally really large studies to be able to predict suicide outcomes fairly well. Fortunately, we have large studies. Uh, Ron Kessler is here today, who's, who's architect at the World Health Organization, World Health Survey, the Army STAR study, really large studies that have taught us a lot about suicidal behavior and its prediction. We know, for instance, this, these are um, onset distributions for suicide ideation across almost 20 different countries. In every country, every culture we look at, suicidal thoughts increase dramatically during adolescence. We know across countries, across cultures, in civilians, in army soldiers, veterans, about a third of people who think about suicide ever attempt suicide. And in the vast majority of times, two thirds or more, the transition from thought to attempt happens in the first year after onset of ideation. We also know, as, as Dr. Bentley mentioned, that post-hospital discharge for a psychiatric condition, there's a huge increase in risk of suicide. So when someone leaves an emergency department, a psychiatric inpatient unit, the weeks after that, the suicide death rate skyrockets and comes down slowly over the next year. So we know that a year after a hospital visit is a really high risk time, regardless of age. And we also know, also through work by um, Ron Custer and, and team, that among those in this post-hospital period, we can, he can, use machine learning algorithms applied to electronic health records to identify people at really high risk. And in this um, seminal 2015 study, sorry, the slides references, problems with reference today, they got a little garbled on the slide. Um, the top 5% of people at high risk accounted for over 50% of all suicides over the next year. So we can identify this really high concentration of risk. So over the past years, we've, we've learned a lot about how to identify who's at risk for suicide, but some key challenges remain. One is, although we can identify people at high risk, we still lack precision. There's a lot of false positives. In our best models right now, over 90% of people we think are at risk never go on to make a suicide attempt or die by suicide. So we identify uh, people in a, in a population um, and we say these are at risk. It's a much smaller percent that actually go on to make a suicide attempt or die by suicide. And this is out of scale. That, that, that circle in reality is much smaller. More importantly for this presentation, we have very little understanding of when those people are going to make a suicide attempt. We really don't have methods right now to identify uh, what imminent risk means and when a person moves into imminent risk. So we don't have a good way of monitoring people over time in the days, weeks, months ahead. And the treatments that Dr. Bentley described um, don't really address whether they decrease suicide risk in the moment. A lot of our psychotherapeutic and pharmacological interventions, which we'll hear about next, occur over weeks or months, but we don't know how to decrease risk in between. So if this is risk of suicidal behavior, a person's coming in with these black lines are, their suicide risk can really skyrocket in between sessions. We have no idea if it does, and we have very little understanding of how to decrease it if we're not even monitoring it. And so this is what I want to focus on today. So I want to spend the time that I have talking about a few recent advances. One is our ability to monitor suicidal thoughts and behaviors and risk in real time. The other is the recent development and proliferation of digital interventions, and Kate touched on some of these at her less intent um, end of the, the spectrum. And then I'll talk a little bit about the really recent development of just-in-time adaptive interventions, which are going to pull this all together. So focusing on number one first. Oh, whoops. Um, that's faster than I wanted to be. So as, as clinicians, I'm a, a licensed psychologist myself, we want to know, is this patient in front of us at risk for suicide now? Uh, what period of time does do existing studies cover? If we look at a recent meta-analysis done by the same group that Kate mentioned for the meta-analysis on treatment, this meta-analysis looked at prediction, prediction of suicide in studies done over the past 50 years. And what this figure shows is how much time has passed in these studies from when a risk factor is assessed until the suicidal outcome occurs. And you'll see, looking from 12 o'clock down to 9 o'clock, about a quarter of studies trying to predict suicide about 10 years or more into the future. 
In some ways, it's impressive. You can predict suicide 10 years into the future, but it's not really helpful in, in the moment, in the clinical session. About another quarter of studies predict suicide five to 10 years into the future, another 30% one to five years into the future. What percentage of all the studies that have been done over the past five decades look at the time period clinicians are really interested in? Let's call it generously the next four weeks. It's one tenth of one percent of all studies. So literally, ninety nine point nine percent of the published literature in the past fifty years doesn't address the time window that clinicians are really interested in dealing with. So we need better data on the natural unfolding of suicidal thoughts and behaviors. Which one the open? I'll do it there. Okay. No. <laughs> Pay no attention to that information. Um, so excitingly or scarily, in the past five, 10 years, we've all effectively become cyborgs, right? We're all walking around with these digital appendages that are collecting data from us constantly, which allows us to, to learn a lot about ourselves and about our patients. And this allows us to do what our colleague in, in the School of Public Health, J.P. O'Neill, has called digital phenotyping. So this moment, moment, moment by moment quantification of a person's experience, which allows us to now measure in a fine grained way what's happening with the person, say, as they move in and out of a suicidal episode. This will allow us to test theories using ecologically valid data, allow us to develop theories we couldn't develop before because we didn't have the data to, 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 to inform those theories. And most relevant here, this provides novel opportunities to intervene before a person is at high risk. Uh, Kate mentioned cognitive therapy trials, DBT trials, you might've noted, they were focused on decreasing the risk of suicide and reattempt. All those trials find some, find people who have made a suicide attempt and try and get them to not make a suicide attempt again. 60% of people who make a suicide attempt die on their first attempt. So we're doing a little bit of a service to people if we're not focused on, on preventing people from making suicide attempts to begin with. So we have to do a better job getting out in front, identifying when risk is occurring and intervening. And as I mentioned, we also don't know what's happening or, or how to intervene between traditional visits. Still on. Uh, all right, so we all now have smartphones. 85% of US adults, according to Pew, have smartphones. So we can put apps on people's phones that ask them four to six times a day about their experience of suicidal thinking. Um, and we ask questions like, uh, among people who say they're having thoughts about suicide, if we follow them over one month time, we'll ask them multiple times per day, how strong right now is your desire to kill yourself? What about your intention to kill yourself? How about your ability to resist the urge to kill yourself? And so doing this, we can measure the ebb and flow of suicidal thoughts and get a sense of what suicidal think thinking looks like in everyday life. And so I think it's just gonna keep doing that. Um, this is the figure that shows for about 50 people what the ebb and flow of suicidal thoughts look like over a one month passage of time. So each tile is a different person. On the X axis is one month passage of time. The Y axis is uh, severity of suicidal thinking, basically the sum of those previous questions. What you notice is there's a lot of variability within person. There's also a lot of variability between people. If we we tried to find out, uh, you know, by staring at this, are there any different profiles or subtypes of suicidal thinking? We didn't see any, uh, but Evan Kleiman, who, who ran this uh, study, did a follow-up analysis using latent profile analysis to see are there any different profiles in these data. And we see that there are. So these are the same data rearranged. We see that there are differences in terms of the, the mean and variability of suicidal thinking. The people in green here, and these are all people who say, I'm having serious thoughts of suicide. The folks in green have low mean, low variability, a lot of zeros in their, in their scores, maybe they go to one or two. People in yellow, low mean, high variability, so a little bit spikier. People in purple, moderate mean, moderate variability. People in red, high mean, low variability. They never come down to zero. And then in blue, high mean, high variability. We did this in a separate sample, ran a late profile analysis for the same five profiles. We see in both samples, people in red, high mean, low variability are most likely to have recently made a suicide attempt. But we don't know is what happens moving over time. Do people move from the green to the yellow to the red? Is the red type most likely to make a prospective suicide attempt? We just don't know. And so we're now doing longer term studies following larger samples of people to see if we can answer those questions and get better at figuring out when is the highest risk time for suicidal behavior? And we're also adding into this, not just self-report surveys, but passive monitoring using things like um, JP Onello's BWE app that monitors people's GPS, monitors their movement over time. We get a sense of whether more movement is associated with healthier activity, 
we're looking at call and text data. Uh, Dr. Vanderbilt asked about sort of connectedness. We want to see uh, the more you're calling, texting others, and they're responding to you, is that protected in some way? We actually see the more you're texting and receiving text, same day, the lower your suicidal thinking. And we're working with um, Raj Picard and team at the MIT Media Lab to have people wear uh, wrist worn biosensors that measure electrodome activity, heart rate variability, accelerometer, and so on. And people hit a little button when they're having suicidal thoughts, they mark the data. And then we're building models to try and predict um, the extent to which these signals can help us identify high risk times for suicidal thinking. And in our initial analyses, things like electrodermal activity really have to predict, heart rate variability, heart rate variability does a little better, accelerometer moving a lot around a lot the night before is the strongest predictor of suicidal thoughts the next day. And so with support from NIMA, we're following um, 600 people over a six month period of time to see can we marshal all these data together to get better at figuring out high risk periods so we can intervene uh, for those who we think are at high risk for suicide. Which brings us to what do we do when we find out that someone's at high risk for suicide in real time? So traditionally what we do is we refer people to the lower end of case continuum. We say call 988, reach out to someone who can help you. It turns out most people who are suggested to reach out to 988, don't reach out to 988, don't reach out to crisis services. What do we do? For years, we've been trying to develop barrier reduction interventions. I say we as a field, how do we identify barriers to care, intervene on them, and try and get a person to be more likely to access care? Shameless self-promotion. I did one of these for my dissertation 20 years ago. It took two years. We recruited and, and, and did a randomized trial with 76 people, and we found that interacting with them one-on-one, -on -one, we could decrease barriers and get people to be more likely to attend psychotherapy. Really exciting for younger scientists um, entering the field is we can do this much more efficiently with digital tools. One of our recent PhD students, Kevin Jarosiski, did a study where working with a platform called Coco, we screened, or we meaning Coco, screened 40,000 people, it used machine learning algorithms to identify people on social media networks who we, the algorithm thought were at risk for suicide. We randomly uh, assigned 1,500 of them to get a brief inter uh, intervention versus not. And this took only five weeks to do. And so Coco briefly is a safety net for social networks. It's a platform that runs through different social media platforms, runs through people's text messages, uses the language to find those at risk and intervenes a little chatbot type intervention. And so the chatbot that we tested here looked like this. So this is Coco in gray. This is a text exchange, Coco in gray, me in blue. So Coco says, hey, I think you're at risk. Where are you? I'm in the US. And then it shows the crisis lines that Kate mentioned that many platforms show. I say, okay, if I'm in the control condition, that's it. If I'm in the treatment condition, Coco says, well, be honest, how likely are you to try that resource? If I say very likely, I'm done. If I say I'm not likely to use that. Now here's the full intervention. It says, okay, here's a list of potential barriers to treatment that we've heard about. Which one's most relevant to you? For instance, I don't want the police call. It's a common one. People don't want to call a hotline because they don't want the police showing up at the door. If I click no police, it says most call crisis centers actually don't end with the police or paramedics showing up. That's extremely, extremely rare, like less than 1% rare for many crisis lines. That's it. That's the intervention. That led to a 23% increase in people's reported likelihood of contacting crisis services in the next few hours, which is really exciting. It was just brief, fully automated, totally scalable. Just one example of many different interventions that are being developed. Uh, other few other quick examples, Joe Franklin team a few years back developed this brief classical conditioning matching game that you can do on your phone and showed across three different randomized trials that people who did this little mini intervention, I won't go into the details of it now, showed significant reductions in suicide planning, suicidal behavior, non-suicidal self-injury, just by interacting with this app. More recently, just a month, a month ago, Pete Franz um, published a paper on digital bibliotherapy, teaming up with a platform called The Mighty, which is a, basically a blog post found blog posts about suicide that were associated with people feeling better after they read them, and then randomly assigned a few hundred people to get these blog posts versus not. People who got them showed significant reductions in suicidal thinking, and those effects were mediated by increases in social connectedness and increases in optimism. Really cool, so again, totally scalable digital interventions. So what do we do? If we can predict, we're not there yet, but when we can predict when people are at risk and we have digital interventions, putting these together, we can start to use just-in-time adaptive interventions to try and intervene. And there's really exciting work happening. This is all led by our colleague, uh, Susan Murphy, who's here at Harvard in statistics and computer science, and she is the architect of JEDI designs, as she calls them. And these are designs that use real-time smartphone sensor-based information to guide the delivery of individualized interventions. 
And so the goal is to, the, the trick is, what I just showed are sort of one-off little quickie digital interventions. How to repeatedly uh, assign people to intervention, push them to them, and then evaluate the effectiveness of those interventions and do it in a way that's adaptive to the person's experience. And so I, I will just fly through this very quickly in the time, but for those who are interested, I would encourage you to check out some of Sue's seminal papers on this, um, this one and the Annals of Behavior Medicine about how to design these studies. A very recent one on how to do micro randomized trials, where she goes and plots a lot of big examples and statistics involved. And then we were fortunate, led by one of our brilliant grad students, Daniel Coppersmith, to, to write a paper with Susan Murphy and team about how to uh, modify these designs and use them for suicide prevention. And so in, in using these designs, they're different than traditional randomized clinical trials. There's different decisions you have to make. One is, what are the decision points? When are you going to intervene? When is it best to intervene? Are you going to do it at a few specific times during the day? Um, only when a person is engaged with their phone? How are you going to intervene? What are their intervention options? Are you going to have a clinician reach out to someone when they're at risk? Are you going to have them, a bot reach out? Um, and so on. What kind of tailoring variables are you going to take into account? If you have GPS monitoring, you know the person's driving, maybe don't send them an intervention if they're driving. Are they at work? Don't send them an intervention at work, and so on. So you can tailor the intervention to the person and then develop some decision rules. For instance, if a person's at high risk, give randomly assign them intervention A or B. If they're at low risk, do nothing. So you want to formalize how it is you're going to, how and when you're going to send people intervention. And these designs are really focused on, as we're monitoring people over time, proximal outcome and testing the causal effects of these interventions on proximal in the next hour or so outcomes to ultimately um, lead to changes in distal outcomes. And one does this using micro randomized trials, which is the experimental design used to test the Jedi. And so I'll show a quick example of this um, credit to, to Walter Dempsey, one of Susan's recent postdocs, who's now a professor at Michigan, who developed this with Kate, uh, myself, and a few others. And the idea is that the design looks something like this. We first observe a person, and we might do this with smartphone monitoring, as we're, we're doing in uh, current work. And then we compute, what is this person's level of suicide risk? And let's consider it on a zero to 10 scale. If they're at high risk, then we'll fit that person in this instance. So each person is repeatedly, dozens, maybe hundreds of times, randomly assigned to different interventions. If they're at high risk, let's randomly assign them to get a human to reach out to them, or maybe like a cocoa type chatbot, more efficient, faster, takes less resources. If they're at moderate risk, let's randomly assign them to get a human, a chatbot, or maybe just the, the pop up that they call a hotline. If they're at low risk, let's give them a lower intensity intervention or maybe nothing at all. Even when, when you're at low risk, maybe uh, getting an intervention is going to diminish the, the potency of the intervention. So maybe doing nothing is even more effective. Then we want to monitor the effects and, and test the effects of these random assignments on proximal outcomes, like reaching out to a clinician, reaching out to someone in your community, and then we'll look at the effects, the long term effects on your digital outcomes. And the idea is to do this iteratively. So to do a, a, a trial, test the effect on proximal outcomes, maybe, and Susan has showed this in some of her early work, there's an early proximal effect, but as the person goes through the trial, the, the effect of the intervention diminishes over time. So you can test moderators of your effects as you move through your trial. Um, so in conclusion, we, we to do just-in-time interventions, we've got to get better at figuring out what the time is. So we're, we're trying to get better at doing real-time monitoring of risk. There are interventions being developed that can be deployed digitally, and JEDIs are providing a really provide a really exciting way to, to test out um, these interventions. What a time to be alive. Um, there are some challenges um, in this area. They're outlined here, but I won't go through them. And I'll just end there by saying thanks to all of our collaborators and funding agencies. And thanks again for inviting me here today. Thank you, Dr. Knapp. So in the interest of time, I just want to make a brief comment that maybe we can follow up on during the panel discussion later. Go for it. I think this is a great uh, presentation and idea to intervene on people directly via their phones, where the decision to intervene at any given time will be based on information that's available at and so maybe we can talk more later about some of the challenges of implementing that in the real world, in real time, via this modality. The question being, do we have all of the information that we need? And relatedly, is there a potential role for clinicians in this process if they can provide some broader context to inform the decisions? Uh, so maybe we can chat about that later. And can I just ask Brian Marks to respond to that with a two-part response? <laughs> 
And if others have questions or comments, uh, please find Dr. Knopfler at the reception later.